everybody. Welcome to our March SPG podcast and our new uh, podcast facility that we just had built. It's going to be great for conversations going forward. Also, as I mentioned in the last podcast, we're going to change the format a little bit. Uh, so I am still going to be having these long conversations when we bring people in, but we want to mix it up a little bit. So this month, what we're going to do is I'm going to go through some general gym announcements, some good things that have happened here in SPG and pass the information on. It's such a big organization. We always have cool things going on. Um, and so it's hard to keep everybody updated. So it's an opportunity for me to pass along some of that great stuff. And then I'll just be real quick with some things that have happened. And then we're going to launch right into a great conversation with Coach Lloyd, Coach Jesse, and Coach Paul Sharp, longtime, two-decade-long SVG member. And I can't think of three people I'd rather have and listen to having a conversation about high-level wrestling. So for those that don't know, if, know if you haven't been to SVG headquarters in the last couple of years, Coach Lloyd came to us a couple of years ago, and he just came to sign up to take jujitsu. And he was in my class, and I figured out pretty quickly that he is one of the most experienced wrestling coaches in our entire state. He's been teaching wrestling all his life. And then as soon as I saw him start to coach and work a little wrestling, I realized that this guy's got a lifetime of precious information. And so we brought him on board. He's been integral part of our gym now and teaching our MMA comp team. And he's just got so much great information. So it's good to hear him talk. This will be the first time many of you that aren't from Portland have had a chance to listen to him. Although you may have seen some of his material is going up on SVG University all the time. And then on top of that, we also have Coach Jesse uh, from SBG Idaho. And Coach Jesse is still fighting. He's got another fight coming up. And he's one of the guys who's a real good black belt who, ha who has truly blended American wrestling with Brazilian jiu-jitsu, which is my coach Chris Howder often says, jiu-jitsu jiu -jitsu is Japanese in origin, heavily modified by the Brazilians, as we all know, and then American influenced. And we can't underestimate that American influence. A lot of what we consider core jiu-jitsu, especially from the Hicks and lineage, things like tucking the tailbone and a lot of the postural stuff we do actually comes from Greco-Roman wrestling. Those are what we call Greco hips. So listening to Coach Jesse and uh, Coach Lloyd talk about the blend of wrestling and Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and as you guys know, who know me and have been around for decades, to me, grappling is grappling. I give credit to my coaches and I will always give credit uh, to the people who taught me. And so I, I call what I do, rightfully so, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. But from a scientific sense, if what you're doing is good grappling, it's good grappling. And um, so it's going to be a real pleasure to hear those two talk. And I couldn't think of anybody better to ask questions than Paul Sharp. Coach Paul has been a bl longtime black belt, longtime functional martial arts coach in SBG. And above all else, he's been uh, uh, an asset as far as the blend of wrestling, functional training, and jujitsu as well. So he's the perfect guy to ask questions. So anyway, we're going to have a conversation I think you guys are really going to enjoy of the three of them. And then after that, they're going to show a clip from Coach Jesse's upcoming series. I saw some of the material he was doing in Idaho. We brought him into Portland to teach a seminar uh, specifically on wrestling for Brazilian jiu-jitsu people. And this is the kind of wrestling that I think no matter who you are, if you're a Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructor or Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioner, this is the kind of wrestling you want to know. This is like the front headlock and how to sprawl and the, the vital information that the wrestlers are better at that we need on the ground. So his series is going to be fantastic. So take a look for that clip and then that'll be this one's podcast. So for the news real quick, we've got a, uh, a brand new SBG location to mention. And that's uh, Straight Blast Gym Zimbabwe. And for those of you that don't know, you've got a fighter out of Zimbabwe who's been doing really good. He's from Coach um, Steve out there, Steve Bazia in South Africa. And uh, he's opening up a branch in Zimbabwe, so that'll be fun. We've got Davey Grant fighting coming up March 11th, so just a few days from now. Davey is such an asset to the organization. He's such a good guy. Uh, a good human being, as well as a great fighter. So it's always a pleasure to watch him step up and fight and represent H SBG. I'm always proud to have him carry that flag. So we'll all be rooting for Davey on that one. Congratulations to Cameron. Cameron Clayton out in SBG Montana, a longtime feature of the Montana family out there. Uh, Well-earned black belt from Coach Travis to Cameron, and I want to give him a shout out. And by the way, if I miss anybody, and it's very possible that I'm missing some black belts or belts that were given out, 
It's hard to keep track when we've got so many locations. Make sure you send that information to email to me or to Zach, and we'll make sure we get it announced because otherwise we basically wind up just having to try and pull these things off the web ourselves and keep track of it. Um, I just finished a seminar in Atlanta at Buford, and it was fantastic to spend time with Coach Philippe and the group he's got going on there. It's, it's, it's amazing. Um, so I can't recommend training out there enough. My book, as you guys know, um, The Gift of Violence, which I've been working on for almost 10 years, will finally be released April 11th. You can purchase it now on Amazon. You can go to my social media and click on it to purchase it. But if you haven't pre-ordered, I'd recommend doing it because I'm not sure how much we'll have left after the initial run. It's always great to do a second run, but uh, if you want to get a copy, I definitely recommend um, ordering now. And I'm going to be doing a bunch of podcasts between now and then, especially towards the very beginning of April. I'll be talking to my my friend Sam Harris. Um, I'll be talking to Megan Murphy here very soon and a lot of other people about the book. So um, keep abreast of all that information on my social media and you'll be able to see that. Uh, I will be headed out to Bend, Oregon, April 29th and 30th for the one year anniversary of our Bend location that's been uh, just opened up. And uh, I'm very proud of that. I'm proud of the, the work that's been done out there. And I'm looking forward to visiting. It's been one year and they've done a great job building up that community out there in Bend. So looking forward to seeing everybody out there. Coach Howder will be here just a couple weeks before that here in Portland, March 12th, 11th and 12th. And he'll be here with his wife, Melissa. Um, and I haven't seen him in about a year, so I'm really looking forward to seeing him. He's going to be teaching one day, and Melissa's going to be teaching another day. And everybody's always welcome to come. You don't have to be an SPG member, but that'll be a real pleasure to have him here at the organization. Last but not least, we've got our spring camp coming up. Spring camp, March 23rd through the 25th, I believe. You can find that information online. Uh, it's already filling up fast. I know we've got at least more than 100 people signed up. Um, it's going to be in Athens, Georgia, which is a beautiful city hosted by longtime SPG coaches, uh, Adam and Roy Singer. We've got people flying in, black belts flying in from Asia, from Australia, from the UK, all coming. And as always, you know, working to present their absolute best material in front of the tribe. So it is, it's quite an experience. If you haven't done it yet, I can't recommend it enough. Come out there and, and join us at camp. I look forward to seeing all of you. I'm headed to New York on the weekend of March 18th to do a seminar. You can find that listed online as well. Um, the school is EFJJA, and uh, I am very much looking to to visiting. I haven't been in New York in quite some time, and uh, I don't. I usually always do seminars in other SPG gyms, and Eddie's not uh, necessarily an SPG member, but he is a friend and, and a longtime coach who I respect a great deal, and I'm looking forward to being out there. So hopefully I'll see some of you in New York. Uh, last but not least, we just finished up our last graduation, our most recent graduation for our ITP program. And for those who don't know, every coach in any of our gyms goes through instructor training programs because we put as much emphasis, if not more, on teaching, as much emphasis on teaching and the skill of teaching as we do learning the technique. And uh, the classes here at SBG headquarters for the last few years have been taught by one of my top black belts, which is Chris Stearns. Chris has been with me for multiple decades. I can't think of a better person to teach that class. And I think this year we graduated, don't quote me on this, but I think there was well over 20 people. And it was nice to be there for the graduation and see them filter out into the community and start to help and do their 100 hours of shadowing people that are on the schedule and then eventually maybe getting on the schedule themselves. And if you're running an SBG gym or a gym that's not SBG, but you're not running this kind of instructor training program, I can't recommend it enough. I think you owe it to your students to have your people go through that kind of training. And one thing that a lot of people have asked is if I'm gonna do the 201. So that was the 101, which we do at least once a year here in Portland. And I think most of the other big gyms that have six or 700 members also do it at least once a year. But the 201, I haven't done in a couple of years. The 101 is a coaching program is all about presentation, how to coach, how to operate a class, how to handle certain things that come up in class, how to handle questions, how to present the material. It's not so much about uh, the techniques themselves. We're not there to uh, criticize people's techniques in that particular class. It's about how you operate and run a good class, in particular, how you present the material. 201 is specifically about the curriculum. 
So it's another notch up. We assume everybody understands how to run the class. And now let's talk about how to put together drills and how we can make our training alive. And we get more into the nuts and bolts of actual training itself. I haven't run one of those in a while. And my intention is I won't have time to do it at this next spring camp. But when we do fall camp, my intention is to run a 201 instructor program. And I'm probably going to do an all day course either the day before or the day after, probably on uh, Friday or a Monday, probably the Monday following camp. So look for that for fall camp, which I believe is going to be in Montana this year. We'll announce it shortly after the spring camp is over. And anybody that's uh, a member of SBG is, and has taken the 101 class is welcome to come out there and take the 201 class with me. And we'll go all day and I can pass that information on to you. And that's always evolving, too. I see guys like Coach Adam Singer, Co Coach Paul Sharp are always going through that and updating it and adding notes to it, all of which I greatly look forward to seeing. So that's all the news that is news for this month. There'll be a lot more next month. And um, I want you to sit back and enjoy this amazing conversation on wrestling for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and hang in there after the conversation's over so you can see a sneak preview of Coach Jesse's series, which I know everybody's going to want to get. And I will see you all next month. All right. So real quick, um, if you guys don't mind, if you want to give your backgrounds, we'll start with Jesse going alphabetical order. Just give us your backgrounds, a little bit about uh, your wrestling background in particular, and then how that brought you to jujitsu and what you've done with it since you've uh, become part of the straight place gym. Uh, boy, I started wrestling when I was in third grade. Um, and then I realized quickly I, I liked it. I was not bad at it compared to the other sports so I stuck with it. I uh, wrestled all the way through high school. Um, I won a state title, that state high school championship in Alaska twice. Um, and I did well enough in freestyle and, you know, out-of-state competitions. I got a scholarship to wrestle at Boise State. Um, it was a three-year starter for him. I won the Pac-10 conference twice. I qualified for NCAAs three times. Uh, never made All-American, unfortunately, but uh, – I really, really enjoyed my experience there. I had, I think, 85 wins in college, so at the Division One level. Um, so, yeah, that was – and then I uh, wrestled freestyle for a bit after that. And um, then I think <clears throat> the second year um, is when I ended up finding MMA and, uh, by extension, Jiu-Jitsu, and started competing. And, uh, you know, it, at that time – been wrestling for a really long time and I was looking for something new but uh you know still kind of in a competitive uh mindset so it may seem like a real natural transition and then yeah I ended up um really enjoying jujitsu while I was training MMA and you know, realized you know just the similarities to wrestling and uh, how the two complement each other so uh, yeah and it just uh, it's been really interesting to for me over the years to really see how wrestling fits into MMA and shit. So how about you, Lloyd? Yeah. Awesome. Very similar background. Um, I started as a, as a young kid in first grade, introduced to it um, through our local high school program, which was great. Um, I stuck with it. I ended up joining um, a club that was, very well known and I started training with them for national tournaments and they invited me to join their team and it was a local club called USA Oregon here in town which was such an amazing experience um, went on to win a couple of high school state titles got a scholarship to U of O and I ended up getting injured out there uh, worked for a while they said I'd come back and try again Still got injured again. I had a pretty serious neck injury. Um, I instantly went into coaching. I became the coach at Clackamas Community College. Uh, from there, I coached there for about 10 years. And then I got invited to be a coach at Portland State. So I went up there and they promised, uh, they promised us five years to build a program. And halfway through our third year or earlier in our third year, they cut the program on us. And so we spent that entire third year trying to save the program. Um, but it was, you know, it's a title nine issue and there's, there's really no fight in that. So we put up a good fight, but in the end, you know, that's kind of the, 
the rough story of, of college wrestling right now is you know, we're up against, we're not a financially driven sport. It's not a huge spectator sport. You know, it's got a lot of, um, it's got a lot of challenges right now. And uh, Portland state as good as they were, you know, the first world champion came from Portland state, the second world champion, you know, they've got an incredible history, but it, it still wasn't enough up against the, the headwinds of what wrestling's struggling with right now. So. Are you guys still involved in coaching wrestling outside of the straight blast gym, or do you do most of your coaching of wrestling within the gym? Go ahead. Oh, um, I am still involved. Yeah. I've been coaching at the high school level in our area, which is uh, Cedar Valley in Idaho. Um, is my 18th season. Um, I was at Mountain View High School uh, for eight. I went to Bora High School for two, and I've been at CUNA ever since. So, uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed staying involved in wrestling. As a coach, it's definitely uh, – it's interesting, you know, um, kind of looking back on my experience as a competitor and now through the lens of a coach, and, you know, I see a lot of the things that my coaches used to get frustrated with. Um and I think it gives you a unique perspective to try to help your wrestlers now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's actually how I found Straight Blast Gym was um, I was coaching at, at our local high school. And my goal was not to be the head coach. My goal was to assist the head coach in becoming, building a team at my local high school. My high school is like in my backyard so I can walk there. And they had a young coach. And over the past 20 years, I've always been involved in this program. So I would go up and work out with their guys and I recruited their guys. Um, so when they brought in this young coach, I really wanted to be a part of building him up and helping him build a program. And after about four and a half, five years, it just became apparent that that wasn't, that we had different goals. His goal was, you know, show up and run practice and have a good time with the kids and um, I really wanted to see them build a program and, and I was a little disillusioned and I didn't have anywhere to work out. So I decided, well, let's find a jujitsu gym and uh, see if I can't get my love of combat out that way. And that's how I found straight blast. And it's been great. Um, the integration, the, uh, the, their hunger to have wrestling here as well. And we've got a great coach in Josh. Um, but it's great to be a part of that and see it grow. And then uh, to be invited in to help with, with the competition team, you know, with their wrestling experience has just been, been great. So that's, fine. that's awesome. I'm always surprised at how deep the wrestling background is in the Pacific Northwest. I guess I was just kind of blind to it being in the Midwest for so long. All you really hear about is Michigan, Minnesota, Iowa, of course. Yeah. And so then when I moved out here, I was like, holy cow, man, there is a lot of high level wrestlers walking around. It's really cool. And I, and I really enjoy seeing the influence of wrestling on the jujitsu in this area. It's really cool as well. Um, if you guys could name three ways that wrestling has benefited you on and off the mat, you guys are lifetime wrestlers. So I know it's kind of hard to say what your life would look like without wrestling because you probably never had a day that you didn't have wrestling. But how do you think, like, three things that you think wrestling has done for you, benefited you, both on and off the mat? Uh, confidence, number one. I was just not a naturally very confident uh, boy, I guess, uh, when I started wrestling. And um, I think it, it, it helped me realize, like, I had some inner strength that I didn't know was there. And, uh, again, I, I kind of found that pretty early. But um, – yeah, that's number one there. Um, obviously, work ethic. You know, most wrestlers will, will say that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I kind of – I got it from my dad, and then wrestling helped really, I think, solidify it. And, uh, you know, and just accountability. Like, you get what you earn, not what you deserve in wrestling. And, uh, you know, I think one of the Brands brothers said it, and it rings true. So, um, you know, I – I didn't get what I wanted as a competitor. Uh, I'm proud of a lot of the things I accomplished, but you know, the thing that I wanted the most, um, you know, was to be a national champion, and I, I didn't get that. And uh, hey, it's 
I, looking back, I see a lot of the mistakes that I made in my training and just my mental approach to wrestling, um, to practice. And, you know, ultimately I, I just didn't figure it out. And, uh, you know, that's on me. It was not on my coaches. It wasn't on my teammates. It was on me and I got what I deserved, um, which was a lot, but not ultimately what I wanted even. I would say um, confidence for sure is going to be right up there on the very top. Uh, beyond that, it's perseverance. There's, if you've ever been in a wrestling practice, there's lots of opportunities to quit every single day. And you have to fight through those. And then you, you become um, conditioned to, I fight through. You know, that just becomes part of who you are and what you do. Um, and then the other thing is like this, this always find a way. You know, there's, you get in those, those grind matches and you look back and you're like, now we were tied up going in, but you always had that ability or that, that inner like drive to always find a way um, to dig deeper, to, to reach further than, than you thought you could. There's times you're, and same in jujitsu, there's times you're in jujitsu and you can't breathe. You know, in wrestling, that I, I think there's more of that. Like you can't breathe, and and you've got to find a way to work through that. And once you do that enough, it just becomes part of who you are. So yeah. I, when I first started, like doing martial arts, people said, "Oh man, you never get tired." And um, and my response was like, "Well, yes, I do. Like I always get tired." Yeah, but you learn to operate when you're tired. And I think that's the thing that like, I appreciate the most about it is, you know, you see with young wrestlers, they start to feel themselves get tired and they panic. And it's just getting comfortable feeling like that and knowing like you're not dying, you're tired. <clears throat> you're going, you know, you just focus and control the things that you can control and you just keep going, you know, and, and operating like when you're tired is something that I think obviously applies to all of us aspects of our life yeah yeah you find a new well of strength that most people will never even know they've got that's for sure yeah. you think that's mostly mental yeah yeah mostly I mean, mindset you know, I, I take that back there, there's a level of uh there's a level of preparedness that allows you to get there mentally without mm -hmm. that you can never get there mentally i would say but once you've got that it then it's much more mental very cool. So what would you guys say is the best style of wrestling? I know you've mentioned um, freestyle and different things like that. And so for the folks that don't know what that means, can you guys kind of break down what freestyle, folk style, and Greco is? Those are the three probably most common, right? So can you guys break those down? And then also, which style do you think works best for jujitsu and submission wrestling? Freestyle and Greco are, are wrestled internationally. Wrestling, they do. And freestyle and Greco. Um, folk style is what we compete here just domestically. And uh, it's generally the style that kids are learning uh, from a young age through middle school and high school and college. Um, most elite wrestlers are wrestling all three styles, though. So you have your folk style season and spring, summer, you're wrestling freestyle and Greco. They're doing a lot more year-round folk style now, too, a lot more than when I grew up. Um, it was freestyle season and after spring, uh, like late spring, early summer, into like early fall, you're, you're competing in freestyle and Greco. Um, and uh, generally, most kids, at least in my area, did both just because it was more matches. Um, you said some kids specialize in freestyle Greco, but, you know, um, with my coach's mentality, I think most of the coaches, that, that coach right on that time, you know, um, I wasn't great at Greco, but it, it, it gave me enough of my body skills that I could be dangerous in different positions. Um, so, yeah. Um, so those are the three, um, what you see and what you see, it's uh, an international competition, it's freestyle Greco. Yeah. So is the question, what which is better or what's the difference? Yeah, so basically, we just kind of want to define for the people that are watching or listening that don't know, you know, there's some confusion sometimes on what's folk style, especially people that didn't wrestle, 
Um, but then also, which do you think is best for uh, jujitsu and I guess we could call it submission wrestling, which is basically no gi now. Mm-hmm. So, what do you guys think works best for that of those three? Man, I don't know which one works best. I can tell you kind of the differences. Um, I would say, you know, folk style that's wrestled in in school and in college is much more mat. There's much more of a grind on the mat. You've got one guy trying to hold somebody down, the other guy trying to escape. Where in the, the international styles, it's much more. Um, well, there's a ton of wrestling on your feet in, in collegiate. The emphasis seems to be more about taking them down and getting the quick score because uh, the referee will bring people back to their feet, similar to like MMA. Like, um, but as far as which one is better, I don't think any of them is better. I think you gain you gain advantages from each different style that'll apply in different places. In my opinion, you know, that Matt grind uh, that applies very well to um, jujitsu being on your feet, you know, freestyle and college wrestling. Great. The clinch Greco Roman for sure, you know, controlling people's hips and those types of things. But I, I don't think there's one that's better or, that in my opinion, I don't know if there's one that really translates better. It just depends on the position and, and the, the goal at that moment, I would say. What do you think? I would say and a lot of it depends on the individual, obviously. If we're talking about uh, uh, submission grappling, um, do you think there's a reason that like lower body um, kickdowns, single legs, double legs, uh, high crotches, things like that um, have been around for so long because they're super effective. If I can control your legs and your hips, you know, I've already got it. it and I can take you down while maintaining that control. I, I've already, I'm, in my mind, I'm halfway to passing you. You know, I've got to control your legs and your knees. And um, that said, you know, if you've got a good clinch game, you can throw somebody directly to their back. Oftentimes, you, you know, you don't even have to pass their guard. So it really depends on the individual. Um, I do think. I do think it's good to have some balance, you know, some upper body skills as well as some lower body takedowns, um, especially against the cage. You know, a lot of times when guys wedge themselves there, it's really hard to throw them off of it. But um, if you have leg attacks, you can scoop them up. You can, you know, pull them away a little bit easier. So, um, you know, if I had to pick one personally as a coach, uh, I would want a folk style wrestler. Yeah. Um, Reason being, like, you learn uh, high percentage takedowns, right? Um, in folk style, at least the way it is now, you have to finish a takedown. Whereas in freestyle, and I, I don't know how much, like, international style you watch now, Lloyd, I've been watching more recently. I mean, it's a lot of push-outs, and guys yeah. aren't actually scoring. They're pushing people out. And my college coach used to talk about this when they started making some of these rules, uh, changing some of these rules internationally, and they were starting to do it at the high school level. He's like, this is killing me He's like, because I'm getting athletes that are winning national titles, you know, cadets and juniors, but some of them can't finish the takedown. And if they're going to come and wrestle for me, they got to be able to finish the takedown. So, um, and with the mat wrestling, like I, I kind of would relate or um, relate freestyle a little bit to like judo where I missed the throw. I just turtle up and, you know, there's the Nawaza, I guess. But, like, a lot of times I'll just stand you back up if nothing's happening. So you don't really get, like, the continuation of the, the grappling on the ground. Um, and uh, so if I'm forced to choose a style as an MMA coach or even a submission grappling coach, I would want to focus on wrestling, personally. Yeah, and maybe talk a little bit about, like, I, in my mind, I kind of think of it like a meanness that comes out of that that college style ground wrestling because you don't get the chance to get brought back up. You're getting you either get away or you get smashed down there. Uh, same on top, you know that guy doesn't stop trying to get away. You've got to hold him down, or or you know there is a real grittiness that comes out of that. I think. Yeah, and in, in, in just the college college wrestling as sport the way it's set up. I mean, you're mm-hmm. talking. If you're a starter on a college wrestling team, this is your schedule, and you're going to get 30 to 40 matches, and your team's counting on you. You're going to make weight. 
every single week. And if you don't, your team's going to suffer. You're probably not going to have that spot very long. Yeah. You know, a lot of guys, and that kind of leads us into um, just kind of the mindset, all that stuff that wrestling develops in people. You know, I never wrestled at the level you guys wrestled at, but I do know, you know, when I turn 21, 20, 21, you know, junior college is over, no more wrestling. There's just a big kind of, not to get too weird about it, but just a big kind of void. Yeah. Like, what am I going to do now that challenges me? I tried all these different martial arts. Yeah. Nothing did it. Nothing was challenging. You know, no matter how much they tried to make it challenging, it just wasn't. And then I found jujitsu, and that's the closest I could come to it. You know, right. and uh, yeah, just that grit that, you know, all of that stuff that it build, builds in you, but it puts you through that ringer. And you just, after a while, you just, you realize how much good it's doing for you. You know, maybe not at the time, but as I got into my late 20s and 30s, I realized I'm a lot different than a lot of the people that are my peers. Yeah. Just because, and I think it's really because of that experience. All right, sorry, we had, um, we're dealing here with, I, I guess, a free account that timed out on us. I did that with Winget too, when I was on with him. There's like, I think when you're, <laughs> like, a certain amount of time. Yeah, yeah. So I think we've got about 40 minutes. So we'll pick up, I'm going to just re-ask that question about the grittiness. Yeah. I'm going to throw it to you, Jesse. Yeah, um, again, like, oh. Hold on a second. And Jesse, uh, tell us what you think of like the grittiness of you know the mat wrestling in college and how that translates and your kind of your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think uh, college wrestling in particular is definitely a grind. I mean, it's this is your schedule, and you start with early season tournaments, you know, um, and you've got kind of the middle of the season. There's a lot of dual meets, and then you're finishing up with your postseason for national. Um. You know, and if you're a starter on a college team, you're expected to be there. Like, that's why they're paying for your school is for you to wrestle for the team. So, and there's a level of accountability. And, um, you know, I was counting on my teammates to be there because I didn't want to lose, you know, individually or as a team. So, you know, we had to show up. We had to make weight. If you didn't make weight, you're letting your team down. You had to be there every day. And, and uh, as a student athlete, too, you had to take care of your studies and – kind of goes back to what you said, which is find a way. Like, I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I got to go get my work done. You know, I got to go do my homework. I got to get this, save for this test. And um, so I think it builds a lot of mental toughness. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if, if you're forcing me to pick a style to build an MMA athlete, I would take an elite folk style wrestler, personally. Yeah, and as a coach, think of this. Like, as you start getting those, those excuses from your athletes, you have a lot less – room to say okay that sounds like a really valid excuse you're more likely to say hey you know that sounds like a road bump you need to find a way over it All right you know as you get into coaching that's my opinion you have a lot less tolerance for that uh kind of the world says you know if i had a hard day i get to take today off as wrestlers we recognize like it may have been a hard day but I'm accountable to myself and to, to my team, but really you learn how to just be accountable to yourself all the time. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah. So I guess you guys would agree then that folk style is probably the, probably the best approach for the, the, definitely the best all around. I would agree. Yeah. Would, for everything. If you're looking for the one that, that, that gives you the most translation. Yeah. 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 At least for me to put a button on it. The thing about this country is, if you have an elite folk style wrestler, they probably wrestled a fair amount of longer. Yeah. Like you didn't get to the elite levels by not wrestling because there. At least when I was growing up, there wasn't a lot of year-round folk style, so I was missing out on literally fifty to a hundred matches and months and months of training time if I wasn't competing in freestyle grappling. So there was, whether they were my favorite styles to wrestle or not, the kids that I needed to beat were doing that. So there's no way I could. So most most of the folk style wrestlers have a high level of freestyle Greco uh, skill as well. And, and to that point, you can also look at it from the angle of, you know, our college wrestlers that are 
that are at the top of their game can pretty easily translate into international styles. They, they have to make some adjustments. Where people that are in um, other countries would struggle much more to convert to collegiate style. I think it's, I think the collegiate style, as you're saying, is much more, um, it, it, it covers more of all of the styles incorporated into one. And so that's why our, our best, our best athletes coming out of college also are able to translate right into the UFC and, and make an impact also. Interesting. So Gable said one time that once you've wrestled, everything else in life is easy. It's kind of what we were talking about with the grind and that grit, building that grit. Do you guys think this is one of the reasons why uh, wrestlers transition to jujitsu and MMA so well is they bring that level of grit and that, that, they were already adapted to the grind. You know, I remember a, there was a Cuban wrestler in the gym I trained in in uh, Miami who said one time, I don't remember a day in my life when I wasn't hungry, tired, and sore. And it's just the way it is. So when the, you bring a guy that's been or a gal that's been brought up with that mentality, like this is normal, get over it, get back to work. You think that's one of the reasons these guys transition so well and then dominate? Go ahead. Um, yeah, it, um, I think one of the things it, it you learn to train in a way that builds that kind of skill. So it's, I mean, striking is hard, man. This is one thing I've learned just going from wrestling into MMA and trying to learn how to box, trying to learn how to uh, pick box, do Muay Thai, actually gra do jujitsu, not just try to survive jujitsu all these sports are very, very hard in their own right. And I, I've had to, as a martial artist, yeah, coming from a different background, I've had to learn to respect other martial arts. And um, I think there was a time when I came over, but maybe I didn't, uh, and I got humbled real quick. So, um, but I also knew how to train myself to do those things, like just because they're very, very similar in how you train. So I think just spending years doing that, it, you know, Okay, you show up at the gym, you do the drills, you get your live rounds, you go home, you come back and do it again. Yeah, there, there's definitely, you know, wrestling translates well, but at the end of the day, wrestling is moving an opponent that doesn't want to be moved. The same as jujitsu, it's, it's, it's grappling. I think a lot of what people underestimate from wrestling is the amount of time that gets put in. You know, it's it, it's incredible the, you know, five, six days a week, years on end, you know, season upon season upon season where they're just one season ends, the next season is beginning. Just that level of, you know, you, like you say, to master anything is 10,000 hours. You know, wrestlers get to that 10,000 hours a lot faster than jujitsu guys do. You know, just because of the amount of time in general that it that takes place on the mat, where a lot of I'm not talking high level jujitsu guys. I'm talking you know your high school wrestler versus your your high school jujitsu guy. Your high school jujitsu guys usually come in twice a week, where your wrestlers come in five to six times a week. They yeah. definitely get a lot of that experience just in time. I would say, yeah. and they're competing a lot more too. You yes. know, there's, there's a saying out there about jujitsu. I'm sure it's been said about a bunch of other sports too, which is one competition is worth two or three months of training. And when you look at a wrestling season, they're getting years of experience just in one season. If you go by that kind of math, you right. know, so I think that translates over to um, what would you guys say to a wrestler who came to you and said, Hey, I want to do this jujitsu thing. Like how should they approach it? What should they do? to prepare themselves to be, to transition into jujitsu. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump on this one first and then you can follow up. Um, I would really want to know where they were in their career. So, I mean, if this is a, a high school guy looking to win a state title, I would tell him to stay, keep it in, you know, a, a very um, elementary level, play with it. Don't, don't go try to be, that'd be my opinion. Um, I will say that I'm earlier in my jujitsu career for sure. So I'm really curious what, where you say on this. 
if it's somebody who's not really competitive, who wants to have fun with wrestling and fun with jujitsu, jump in, man. It's, they're both a blast. They're both going to be a great workout. They're both going to be great for your heart, mind, and soul. Um, I would say dive in and enjoy. But I would put that caveat in there. As I would want to know where they were in their careers. I wouldn't want them thinking two different rule sets and having you know a successful career somewhat um, disrupted by a different rule set that might make it challenging. That would be my thought process. Yeah. That's smart, actually. Um, that one thing I've learned, you know, again, just I, I really have learned to respect other combat sports and, you know, watching these athletes, athletes compete in just the highest level has been a very specific rule set of combat, you know, from you to you know, to just the differences between those two and how much focus it takes to be world class at that particular style. And then boxers, big boxers, um, you know, it, so it, if you are a competitive wrestler, I, I think I would maybe use it as some cross training, you know, during the, the breaks that you might have during in between wrestling season, you know, maybe before end of like freestyle, you know, before you start getting into high school season, you know, time to get on there and play with it and have fun, you know. Um, I, I didn't learn it till later uh, when I started transitioning to, to martial arts to try to have some fun when we're doing this. And uh, I think it, it harmed me as a wrestler, just not really allowing myself. Um, and, I, and I wish something like jiu-jitsu had existed because it would have kept me on the mats, but I think I would have, you know, had a lot more fun, um, probably been more successful as a result. So, and then just if, if they are serious about learning it, whether it's because they want to do martial arts or they just want to be a, a more well-rounded grappler, uh, take it serious and learn it and don't just try to out wrestle somebody in a jiu-jitsu match. Um, Cause you know, in a fight in a jiu-jitsu match, jiu-jitsu wins and your wrestling can help you a lot and it, it'll give you an, um, you know, the ability to do certain things, but ultimately you're not learning submissions in wrestling, you know, pinning somebody doesn't finish a fight. So, certain things you're going to have to learn certain things you have to unlearn and uh, or be able to apply your wrestling in a different way. Um, I guess, you know, the, the, the big example is like not pinning somebody with your chest um, until you get to a dominant position, like being in guard. I'm like, I'm pinning you, yeah. but I'm not, I'm not doing anything. You know, I have to learn to posture. I got to break that guard. Then when I get outside mm -hmm. and I actually get into a dominant position, then I like, pressure with my chest and, and trying to unlearn that is a, a really difficult thing for a wrestler. So take it serious, learn jujitsu, put the gi on. Um, that helped me exponentially. I finally listened to the, the guy that was coaching me at the time. I was like, I, was like, oh, I don't want to put the gi on. I'm, gonna, I'm here to learn it for MMA. It's like, I assure you, it's not going to hurt your MMA. Uh, and he was right. I just put out all those other thoughts out of my head. Like, I'm just going to learn jujitsu the way it's been taught for however many years because I'm not that special that I need it, you know, different. So, and, and I got a lot better jujitsu when I did. So that's cool. If you guys could go back to the beginning of your wrestling career, what would you do differently? I'll go look. Um, boy, there's, there's an infinite number of things looking back. If you know, cause you can critique, critique yourself against the ideal, right? Um, what would I, I would have joined the club that I trained at sooner because the level of, um, for the first five years or so of my wrestling career, I had no idea what actual training was. I had no idea what the actual grind was. I had no idea what really clean technique was. It was learn a double leg, grab their legs, take them down, you know? but it wasn't the fine details. And I would have really emphasized on those fine details earlier. Um, I know I brought up a lot of bad habits from, from my early days. I mean, kids wrestling is a lot of bad habits anyway. Um, but I think I would have started off more basic where more people think, well, I want to know more moves. I want to know more of this and that. I would have been more basic and focused more on the smaller details than, uh, 
I think early on it was like, how many moves can I learn and how many big flashy things can we do, right? I think that's probably one of the things I would have done different. Um, in high school, I probably would have went to a different school just because I didn't have many workout partners at my high school. So, but as far as doing things different, I mean, there, there's an infinite number of things we could do different if we, we look at ourselves in comparison to the ideal. Yeah, for sure. For me, I think most of, I don't want to say regrets, but, you know, realizing where I went wrong was when I got to college. Um, I'm actually, personally, uh, really grateful I grew up where I did, where and, and um, there wasn't as many opportunities. Like I see these kids in our area and they can wrestle year round and they have access to incredible coaches. And um, and I had a great, incredible coaches as well, but like the talent pool that I had to compete against um, was a lot smaller. And we had to really work hard to fundraise and go wrestle out of state. And, like it was, it was a big deal. We could just jump in a van and cross three lines and have a whole new group of uh, people to compete against. And in some ways, like, I think it made me a lot better um, because, and I think my college coaches at the time realized that too, like I was competing with good kids in a situation that wasn't necessarily conducive to like me building that skill, you know? Um, and, and I think they realized my ceiling was really high because of that. And they took a chance on me because looking back, I, I um, and I, I found this out later The the only reason that my coach actually recruited me was on a recommendation from a guy that lived up there that uh, coached at a neighboring high school. And uh, he asked Chris, asked Johnny, Chris was my college coach, asked Johnny, who was um, a, a guy that coached at the, the rival high school of, uh, of ours, if he had any lightweights. And he mentioned my name. And uh, for whatever reason, Johnny saw something in me and, and Chris started watching me and realized I'd wrestled enough freestyle that he could get eyes on me. And um, but again, like looking back at like my credentials compared to, you know, some of the kids that were recruited with me, um, I didn't have them. So uh, I'm really grateful for that because I came in, and then I started beating guys that I was not in the same like uh, stratosphere of when I was coming up. So. Um, you know, I, I think in some ways I'm really happy that, uh, at least in high school, it played out the way it did. And, and then I think when I got to college, there's some, I just kind of went wrong. I think in a lot of my approach to practice, I, uh, I started really keeping score in practice, which is a really difficult thing not to do. Um, you know, in wrestling, we're trained to win all the time. And I think, if I, if I were to go back and coach college wrestlers, I would really emphasize using practice for practice and yeah. don't keep support. And again, it's a hard thing because you're, you are bred to win. And uh, not only are we bred to win, we're bred to win every position, every second. Right. Yeah. And, and so you give up on those abilities to like have the, the growth in the scrambles. It's just, can I win that scramble? You know, it's just strength and speed and, so let's talk a little bit about that. What some of what you guys are bringing up was just about like training methodologies and approach to training. And, um, you know, Chris Hodder is kind of famous for saying that jujitsu is Japanese in origin and it's Brazilian modified and American influence. And we really see the American influence in training methodologies, um, incorporating the wrestling into all of this stuff. But really, where I see the biggest difference is. The drilling, you know, one of the when I first started training jujitsu, I was really surprised that they would show us a technique. We would do it without resistance for a little while, and then they would turn the timer on and just now we're doing rounds. And there was no step in between there, no rungs on the ladder of drilling and how to put this together and chain things together. So what how would you guys? Coming from the backgrounds you guys have, it's real deep in wrestling and a lot of experience getting coached and coaching at a high level. How would you structure a jiu-jitsu workout coming from your perspective? What would be the ideal structure? I am defer to you. You've got a lot more experience in the jiu-jitsu side of it, so I'm really interested in your answer. Um, go ahead. 
I'm looking back at like the way my coaches ran practice, I think what they were trying to get out of us was real similar to like what Matt tries to communicate to coaches and his students. And <clears throat> you know, the, there is the introductory phase of uh, of learning where I need to know which body parts go which where where and in which order, and uh, and then you know start to introduce some resistance because that's where you're going to see the holes in your technique. And I think. You know, looking at, uh, again, back to what my coaches were trying to get out of us, I realized they were trying that. I, I don't think they knew how to articulate it as well as Matt. Um, and it's cool to, you know, try to explain it to my wrestlers now a little bit better. And um, But I think just a lot of situational wrestling, and that's essentially what the I method is, is situational grappling. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and being able to kind of dial it up or down depending on, you know, what you're trying to work on. And sometimes we need to take a few steps back towards the introductory phase. Sometimes we can start to take a few more steps towards integration. But, I mean, really, it's just about getting reps and, uh, and you know, having a partner that's giving you realistic looks because then you just sort of figure it out. Yeah. And, you get, and you don't get injured. So Yeah, for sure. You don't get injured, is that what you said? Yeah, I think, I yeah. think once we know the parameters where we're supposed to be, and when, again, it, like this is the the situational or the the um, isolation side of it. I think a lot less injuries occur because I get outside of these parameters. I'm going to go. I'm going to reset back to where I know I'm supposed to be and what I'm supposed to be working on. And again, like people get injured in scrambles, you know, where they're just over somewhere over here, you know. Get in a completely different position. Maybe they end up, you know, for a newer grappler, I don't even know where I am. I'm just, I don't even know what I'm supposed to do. But when they have, you know, really specific parameters and you know kind of what can occur in there, then you're pretty safe relatively. And uh, so I think the injured a lot less training that way. Yeah, definitely. I would agree. Um, it's a tough question because the reason or part of the reason in wrestling, we do so many reps, we have a definite idea of where we want to be at the end of our of our journey, right? Do we want to be high school state champions? Do we want to be a college national champion? Do we want to be, you know, what are those goals? And we're training and we're willing to put in what oftentimes isn't the fun part because we know where we're headed. And I think in jujitsu, it's a little different because most people are coming to jujitsu or at least here, my experience in kind of my level of jujitsu, they're coming here to have fun, hang out with their friends, to learn some stuff, to get better. But there isn't that goal of I want to be a national champion, right? And so if you've got those goals of I want to do X, Y, or Z, it makes it easier to go through the things that aren't as much fun. And I think that's a little bit of where wrestling and jujitsu, I mean, why you see so many drills and reputation and that, that grind is because they're trying to get to a certain place. And I don't see that as much in jujitsu. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, if that makes sense to you. Yeah, I, I think wrestling has the benefit of a very clearly defined infrastructure. Like yeah. when you sign up for middle school wrestling, it's to be like state champion in middle school. When you sign up for high school wrestling, it's to be a state champion in high school. When you sign up for, you know, if when you join a college team. Like it's it's very clearly defined, you know what what our goals are. Jiu-Jitsu, man, there's so many different rule sets. Everybody's trying to make money. IBJJF, gi, no gi. It's like hard to find a lane, at least in my opinion. Um, and uh, and I think because of that, it's it's really easy to just uh, I don't know. I'm just gonna have fun. And um, and you know, quite frankly, that's kind of where I'm at too. Um, there was a time where because there's so many different ways you can go with it. And I think that's one thing jiu-jitsu doesn't have going for it. Like, there's a lot of opportunities to compete, but, like, like what lane are you going to be in? And yeah. you know, what what lane is going to get promoted? And, again, it's a for-profit model for these competitions. So it's just different. Um, and, uh, and at least, you know, that's what I see. And um, I think if there was, if there was jiu-jitsu in high school, you would get that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Jiu-jitsu champion. You know, and I would that would be badass, and I would I would sign up to coach that. <laughs> That's right. I also would say that uh, I'm I know kind of that that drilling the benefits of that, 
but I'm also equally guilty of it's just so much fun. I just want to come in and roll and play sometimes, you know? So part of that is like, like you said, I don't have a defined place that I want to end up. Like someday I would like to end up with a black belt, but it's not like I'm training to be, you know, make the Olympic team or anything. I, I'm here more recreationally. I want to get my, my combat fix out of, out of my day. Right. So I'll see. There's also that. Right. How do you guys see yourself now? How do you see yourself? At, do you see yourself as a, a wrestler who does jujitsu or like, a, is there like an all encompassing, like I'm a grappler. So just throw me a rule set and let me compete. Or how do you guys look at yourselves now? For, I would say for me, I would say I'm, right now in my journey, I'm a jujitsu person with a wrestling history. Um, because I'm not trying to get better at wrestling and actively trying to get better at jujitsu. So I'm considering myself a jujitsu player with a wrestling background. Cool. I think I've come to adopt probably since Brown Belt, like the, the last thing you said, Paul, which is a grappler. Um I, I you know understand the wrestling side of things, I think relatively well. Um but I I, I take pride in that. Like I, I think um and it for probably up till like purple it was i was a wrestler that did jujitsu you know um and i wanted people to see my wrestling in my jujitsu and now you know i don't care i mean it comes out it just it's always going to be there but i i really i like it i take it as a really great compliment when people tell me i don't look like a wrestler um leah said that once to me and i was like you don't you don't pass card like a wrestler anymore. Like, nice. Well, I'm nice. learning something now. So, uh, nice. Yeah, I, I I like being a grappler, and um, recently, you know, some stuff up against the cage has started to like click more, and I think that's like the side of grappling. You know, what do you do? With the barrier behind, it. and uh, you know, I'm like I've been wanting or enjoying teaching that. I feel like I'm starting to figure some stuff out and you know, create kind of a more cohesive system. And so grappler. Oh, grappler. That's the answer. Nice. <laughs> nice. All right. So um, just kind of getting to the end here. Well, um, a lot of our growing gorillas, our kids program, they will become interested in wrestling. We had a good, one of our really competitive kids and jujitsu comp team kind of broke my heart a little bit because he said, I'm going to take time off from jujitsu to compete in wrestling. But then there was the wrestler side of me that was really proud of him because he's Jackson. a junior. Jackson. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think he's a junior, which is late to start wrestling. He didn't have the best result, but he was, uh, he was glad he did it. And I was like, you doing it again next year? He's like, no, I'm seeing it. Yeah. <laughs> too late, man. <laughs> so what, what would you go what advice would you guys give i i just told him go for it man and i'll see you when the season's over and um what advice would you guys give though to the parents or the kids that come to you and ask you you know i want to do wrestling what should i do first i want to what what is their motivation right why is it they want to do wrestling um <clears throat> There's also a very finite or limited amount of time that they have to do wrestling. So if that is something they want to do, you know, do it while you're young for sure. It's I, I don't think it's the best sport to jump into it at 40 years old. Not for any other reason other than you're so far behind the curve that, you know, just take it as it's just going to be it's just going to be recreational for you at that point. It's not competitive wrestling. It's not the same thing. Um, but I want to know why they're they're looking at wrestling. If it's to improve their jujitsu, I understand that. Um, so I want to know that motivation. But I also recognize in wrestling there is a finite amount of time that you really have to experience and and play with it if that's a goal of yours. Or jujitsu, you know, we've got Dr. John here who's seventy one or something years old. Um, jujitsu is something that you could do done correctly for the rest of your life yeah so i would i would definitely say i would encourage it i think it's a a, a great sport it teaches a lot of great lessons 
but if somebody came to me at 40 years old and said, I want to, I want to take up wrestling and I'm thinking about doing some tournaments, I would say, you know, come to my class and have some fun and get better at jujitsu. Yeah. Yeah. Um, probably a similar approach. Um, you know, most of the people that the young kids that tell me they're going to wrestle, they also have expressed an interest in doing an MMA. So I'm usually encouraging it. For all the reasons we mentioned early on, you're going to get a lot of matches. You're going to be accountable to people other than just yourself. Um, and you're going to go through a grind. You're going to develop a skill set that's going to be beneficial to you. And uh, I want them to have that. And, and generally, I tell them, all right, I'll see you after season. Because number one, I know if you're going to like fully commit to – even if you don't win a state title or, you know, podium, I, I need you committed to that. It's a, it's an accomplishment for these kids to finish the wrestling. Season. Yeah. You know, I tell our, our young athletes that we got a really young team this year, really young. Um, and like guys, for some of you, like finishing the season is going to be an accomplishment, but that's a worthy goal. Like work for it yeah. try to accomplish it. Um, you know, we'll reevaluate next year. And, but like some of you, that's going to be your state championship is finishing the season. You might not even go to districts because you're the number three guy. Be here for your teammates. Be here for the, the week of leading up to state after districts. Like, because they need that. If they're going to compete in a cage, like, I, I think you have to have that. Yeah. And, um, and uh, I would want them to, to show that commitment to their team. Like Lloyd said, jiu-jitsu is always going to be there. And uh, they have so many years that they can actually wrestle in middle school, wrestle in high school. Most of these guys aren't going to wrestle in college if they're starting then. Like they would have had to start as children. Um, but uh, – and then, you know, yeah, really go for it. Like give it – learn wrestling just the same way that you have to learn jiu-jitsu as a wrestler. It's really cool. Gigi's son is uh, he wrestles and he's okay. He's getting a lot better, but um, you know he's had to commit just to wrestling during wrestling season. You know, I, from what I understand, he doesn't go back and do jujitsu after wrestling practice. And yeah. uh, it's cool. He's getting a lot better. He's, he's uh, you can tell there's certain positions he's just he's not comfortable in, and but it's been really cool to watch him. Yeah, and just there's for the also, people, for the I people that don't also, know, go ahead. I was just going to say, just for people who don't know, Gigi is a coral belt. And so his son's been doing jujitsu probably from the womb. So, yeah. I was going to say, there's also a level of humility that you have to have to get through those early years, right? And you have to be, I think, getting through that allows you, um, you've got to have that humility ongoing. So, there's always going to be somebody better. And it helps out in jujitsu and it helps out, it makes you more coachable. It makes you a better athlete. If you're able to get through that, you know, those early years, like you're talking about, you know, it'd, it'd be really easy to step aside and go, Hey, maybe that's not my sport, but the, the amount of life lessons you gain from accepting that and continuing is incredible. Yeah. Very cool. So okay. Jesse, you got a series coming out um, through SPG. You, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Uh, Matt approached me about it last year and um, or early in last year, and I, I got to go out in the summer and, I guess, wrestling for jiu-jitsu and really nothing too special. I just kind of picked a lot of wrestling positions that I feel people that try to wrestle um, in jiu-jitsu end up in. Um, three main ones being, like um, – or two main ones, I should say, like front headlock and rear waist lock. Um, you know, you don't see a lot of jiu-jitsu guys running through double legs. It's just it's something that, uh, you know, people are more wired to go to the back. So if they get in deep on the hips, they're generally like releasing, coming around to the back, and you end up in the um, And then, uh, you know, I've used like my Wednesday wrestling class is just kind of a little Petri dish to, to test things. And, um, and uh, I think I – kind of like condensed it down into real like high percentage stuff that's easily in implementable and isn't going to get anybody hurt so um the front headlock is the one that i think uh I'd, I'd spend the most time on um and you know 
it's cool because like the ink's never really dry on anything and uh i've already figured out things i would do differently if i refilmed it so um you know just in just the experience of like filming it i, I learned a lot too um so i hope it's helpful to people um you know i spent a lot of time kind of putting it together trying to figure out a, a progression to introduce things and you know doing that in front of matt was a nerve-wracking experience but um, <laughs> got some good feedback i think so good um yeah i'm excited i, I hope it uh it benefits people and you know I, i'm obviously open to any suggestions cool uh, I, I had the pleasure of being able to to take your uh seminar while you were here and it was fantastic it, it was really good it was stuff that everybody could use that that position from the back where you're instead of pulling people on top of you you're taking them forward i love that Forever, I, I've always hated the guys that like to pull people on top of themselves, but I love the way you approach it, and it's it's very teachable. Um, so I'm actually stealing your your back take stuff and showing it here in the gym. It's fantastic, and I've been you know I've been around wrestling forever, and it, just some fine details that that were really critical. But it's also it's it's foundational. It's it's not big flashy stuff. You know, pulling something on top of you is almost more flashy, but it, but what you're showing is it's fantastic. It was great. I'm glad I got to go to the seminar, and I can't say enough about it. It was great stuff. So my goals for this series is for people that are less experienced with wrestling to be able to be in wrestling centric positions like more confidently be able to add more wrestling techniques to their just what they do already in terms of um, their jiu-jitsu their judo and again just be able to to be there be more comfortable be more confident and, and not be scared to be in these positions who's this series for this series is for anybody um if you are a jiu-jitsu practitioner that wants to add more wrestling wants to add more skills to your stand-up grappling game this is for the wrestler that wants to understand how the wrestling that they know already will, will work in jiu-jitsu because there's a lot of ex uh, positions that they won't experience anymore and there's some danger to, in jiu-jitsu that uh um that wrestlers often find themselves in because they they're i think they're trying to wrestle in a jiu-jitsu match as opposed to apply wrestling in a to a jiu-jitsu match for people who've never wrestled before, what's the most difficult part of wrestling? And do you address that in the series? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing is like the fear that people have. When you watch wrestling, you watch like highlights of just world-class wrestlers. It looks pretty brutal. Guys are getting picked up and slammed. Their heads are, in, are all torn up. They're cut. They're bloody. Um, that can happen, obviously. But um, those are uh, wrestlers that are wrestling at the highest level. It's a sport that um, you know, has a particular rule set. There's positions that occur only in like high level wrestling matches like that, okay? So, so this is, uh, I'm hoping with this series, we can start to just like not be so scared, understand that like efficient grappling is a, across all different disciplines, whether it's judo, whether it's jujitsu, whether it's wrestling. And you know, all we're doing is just applying the, the principles that we've explored so much here at SBG towards wrestling a little bit more. If I've never done any wrestling before, can I still get anything out of this series or do I have to come in with previous experience? 100%. If you have never wrestled a day in your life, you're going to gain something from this. You're going to understand the way I want to stand, the way I wanted to like approach um, the, the match as it starts on the feet. And if nothing else is going to make you more confident, just getting in there, hand fighting, and then entering into some of your jujitsu techniques. Do you have any background in MMA? Will the material in here translate to self-defense or fighting? A hundred percent, yes. Uh, we didn't adapt it in this series to a, an actual fight. It was more for a jujitsu match. But everything that you see applied here, we apply up against the cage at my gym with our fighters. I've used it in the cage successfully. Um, and it definitely, it can be adapted very easily. Um, you know, I think everything we do here at SBG in particular applies across all realms, gi, no gi, self-defense or fighting. All right, guys, so we got two minutes to wrap it up. Any final thoughts you guys want to offer to anybody listening to this about wrestling and jujitsu and all that? Um, yeah, I, I just don't be scared of wrestling. Yeah. I know it's kind of like, I think because 
people see like the sport and obviously it's it can be a little intimidating but it, wrestling is a martial art like anything else and if you put the time in you can learn it and uh you know it, your expression of it might be different than you know lloyd's or myself or you know that gnarly college wrestler that's on your team but like it's, it's martial arts is physics and, uh you know it doesn't have to be scary and again how much you choose to actually implement into your grappling is just um, you yeah have fun with it it's i i think as as human beings and especially as men we're we're hardwired to to get in and play like puppies and roll and and you know test ourselves and try to move other people and try not to get moved i think that's hardwired innate in us and enjoy it you know relish in that time you get to spend on the map because it's in me for me it's sacred time so perfect all right man thank you guys thank you yeah jesse (laughs) later guys i'm good